Morning. Morning. I guess we have a couple of things brewing. Um, Julian Alfred, of course, off to a brilliant start to the season. Uh, we know at the beginning of the season we have the shortened forms. In terms of 60 beaters, this is where you get your impetus to drive you going forward. So we have that ongoing. We have continued works at the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds. Works continues at the Mindo Philip Park. Just attended the Leones Secondary School uh, opening ceremony for the school sports. And the Grosely playing field is expected to be closed from tomorrow for commencement of works ahead of ICC Cricket to World Cup. In addition to that, uh, Tariq Edward returned to St. Lucia from the Under-19 Cricket World Cup in South Africa. Let's go. Okay. So, Olympic Chief, you spoke about Julian Alfred, mm -hmm. but I want to speak to you broader. Uh, why is St. Lucia, in terms of preparations for this year's Olympics, you know, this year we, we tried to, to get a medal for Paris 2024? It's luck. I can't think of it. No, you can't even send a shot like upside down. Oh. Yes, but in terms of preparations for Paris, okay, so we, uh, Paris Olympics, it's a very individualistic sport in terms of track and field. So we have two individuals who have qualified, and that's Michael Joseph from the community of Grosley in the 400 meters, Julian Alfred from the community of Cicero in the 100. Both are athletes that have professional coaches. Uh, Michael is in this, the college system, so he's still part of his college track and field team. And so his training and his regimen would be based on that. In terms of Michael Joseph, there are a number of competitions that he's already written to me as Minister of Youth Development and Sport that he would like to participate in, in preparation for the Olympics. And so... Uh, it is left to me to find the funding. And of course, we do have the funding with the national lotteries in our budget at the ministry to ensure that he gets that preparation, that level of preparation. What we want to see is the actual communal support behind our athletes. And so I've had meetings with uh, some of his family members and we've set up a committee that will commence the Michael Joseph Road to Paris sort of activities in terms of fundraisers, in terms of bringing the community uh, behind the athlete. In terms of Julian Alfred, Julian Alfred still has a budget um, from last year that we have set aside for her preparation for Olympics. And so she continues to train with Coach Flo at Texas. And we are already seeing a very fast start to her season, breaking the 60 meter record at the last event. What we are hoping to do this time around is to, you know, stay even closer with Julian Alfred. Um, we realize that she will not be in the collegiate circuit and we actually believe that works better for her. So she would be more relaxed. She would have more, you know, more focus on the Olympics. And we are very confident that these two athletes will continue to do very, very well. In, in terms of the other sports, I think we have, uh, did you qualify for sailing this year? I'm not too sure. No, um, Luke has not qualified. He have a couple of events coming up um, and we are hoping that he can do well. We, he's very, very close. We certainly hoping that he would qualify, and that would mean that for the first time in our history, we have two individuals from the constituency of Grusley participating in the Olympics. So I look forward to Luke meeting that qualifying standard. Um, he is somebody that is very focused. He has a very good mind on his, uh, very good head on his shoulder, very good parental support as well. He also have a couple of initiatives that he wants to undertake in the constituency of Grusley in terms of you know, providing the sport to making it accessible to other young people. And so as the minister and of course the parliamentary rep, I will be providing that level of support for him. And so these are the three individuals that we are certainly hoping will not just represent us at the Olymp Olympics, but they will do very, very well. Okay, tell us anything about the um, meeting tomorrow with the residents of Rosalie? I don't know my business. So. The helipad. No, not... I guess, about the, um, well, the helipads at the, the private. Okay, yes, yes. So in terms of the helipad, I have heard most of that information, but I was not invited to that meeting. And as parliamentary rep, I've taken an approach to not get involved in things that I'm not necessarily invo um, invited to. But I do pay very close attention to what those developments are. I am aware that it's something that will bring some value to our community in terms of persons getting that additional option to land and to get into my community and my constituency and spend money. So 
I'm just certainly hoping that when it's done, that the level of persons who are able to afford to land um, in the community would definitely stop at our various bars, our food outlets, and support our, our people in the community. Um, we also have a meeting ongoing currently for jazz uh, with the constituency council. I was invited to that one, but it's a cabinet day, and this is actually the first day of my vacation for the next two weeks. Um, but with budget coming up and a number of initiatives uh, happening in my constituency this week, I thought it was important for me to come around and do what we need to do. Yeah, and Mr. Minister, we know that too, that we focus on the year of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we know the grocery playing field has been pivotal. It's part of the preparations for the, um, the, the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if I show you what about for this year alone, that there's been talk about, you know, um, upgrading the grocery field. In all this um, um, works, will there be some, some, um, um, some, some time taken to at least do some upgrade to the Grizzly playing field? Absolutely. Um, before the end of 2024, I'm hoping to describe the Grizzly playing field as the Grizzly Mini Stadium. And so we've partnered with a number of corporate, corporate individuals that have um, committed large sums of money and also the National Lodges Authority and, of course, some of the World Cup prep that we have going on right now to ensure that this becomes a reality. As I said, we are closing the field next week. And uh, I had to write officially to Sandals to allow us to use the area next to the landings for sports activities for a community of Grosley. Considering what we've been dealing with, we do not want to have them displaced. Sandals has agreed to allow us to go in there and to uh, pretty much excavate a standard playing football field so we can still have our little competitions while for the next six, seven months, we'll be having the upgrade of the Grosley playing field. What we'll see is stands, we'll see an enclosure, and we'll see an actual upgrading of the surface of the Grosley playing field, which means Grosley as a semi-professional team will have a home uh, come the end of this year for gate receipts and some of the commercial activities that the people of Grosley actually deserve. Any new updates for alternative spots? Oh. <coughs> This weekend, well, we have a calendar of activities out. Um, I do not have it with me right now, but we have a number of activities happening uh, in the following weekend, the Independence Weekend, in terms of drag racing. Um, and so we're expecting a number of people to go to the place commonly known as the Kakabef in Viewfort to take in some of that. Unfortunately for me, well, fortunate and unfortunate, the activities happen around my birthday. So I'm not sure how much of it I'll be able to take in, but I'll certainly be in and around the area to support alternative sports. Uh, we had some challenges this year with motocross in terms of the venue, but we continue to say to individuals uh, in that sporting fraternity that we are here as a government to support them. We provided and we started, initiated the alternative sports season so as to include them in our activities. And so we're certainly hoping that we can sit at the table and ensure that we do a little bit more. We have a national chess competition are coming up as well, as well as darts and um, some other competitions in alternative sports. So we're certainly hoping that everybody that is interested in a sport could have their time to shine um, with this government. Speaking of alternative sports, um, we know that, that eSports has grown, right? There's an ongoing eSports craze, I should say. Yeah. What has been done to develop that, that sector? Well, the, the thing about alternative sports, since it's been left for so long, uncoordinated. We have a number of different individuals with different associations, with different organizations doing their thing. So you would find there's no one central St. Lucia Esports Association. And when I came in, that was one of the first things we tried to hone in on, to have an Esports Association. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. I mean, a multi-billion dollar industry. And so one of the first things I did as minister, as I traveled with our national um, esports team to really take in some of the competitions and to ensure that we can have that here. Um, what we want to do in the near future is actually have a home for esports, which pretty much is a room with, with you know, widescreen televisions and you know, at least sitting areas for, for people to enjoy themselves. But we're certainly hoping that we can have our esport champion uh, be developed in the region and the world. Um, it's certainly something that I'm passionate about as Minister of Youth and Sport. And so we're certainly hoping to have some progress in the coming year. And briefly suggest um, what, what is the um, status with the 
Mozilla Police Station. Yeah, I'm very satisfied with the progress that we're making at the Grosley Police Station. Um, we are seeing a number of young people from the community being employed, which is one of the things as a parliamentary rep you want to see. Uh, different skills being, you know, utilized in a way that is productive for the entire constituency. We know the history of the Grosley Police Station. It's non-existent for almost eight years. And of course, when we came in as a government, we thought for, for a constituency of over 30,000, I mean, security was something that we really had to hone in on. And so we saw the commencement and I'm very satisfied with the pace at which the, the works are ongoing. So we're certainly hoping that very, very soon we'll have more visuals for you all in terms of pictures and we can have a, a safe place, a comfortable place for our men and women to provide security for our people. Uh, the old police station um, in Masad, uh, this, is, this is an area that is aimed for a different sort of development uh, at, during my campaign. I made mention of a, a bank, not a bank, a credit union for Grosley. We know that Library has the credit union, Monrepo has the credit union, and for a while, the most populous constituency did not have a credit union. I've had some very good meetings over the last three weeks um, in terms of putting the dynamics together for Grosley um, Credit Union. And so very soon you will see some movements where that old Grosley Police Station was, as later on in the year we develop our Grosley Credit Union. And what is the time frame on the, 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 the police station? Um, I remember the Honorable Prime Minister gave it an 18-month period. I'm not sure how many months have gone by so far, but I can tell you that I'm, I'm very happy to see the progress. I know uh, it cannot come too soon because our police, they are really struggling um, in terms of the accommodations at the HRDC and the Pastoral Center, but it's something that we continue to appreciate in terms of their, their sacrifice. Uh, it's not ideal, but it is pretty much the best we can offer right now. And we know that we will reap the, the benefits of what we are doing right now in terms of the comfort going forward, in terms of a gym, in terms of a court, in terms of a holding cell. And so we just we are we are practicing deferred gratification when it comes to policing um, in Grosley while they still do their utmost best. And so I want to say thank you to the police um, in Grosley and tell them to just be patient with us. The progress is there. I believe that a sort of turning ceremony in you know, September last year for a park in Grizzly. Mm -hmm. was the update on that this thing was moving. The park is actually moving even quicker than initially anticipated. The only the only problem we've had is the constant rains. I don't know if anybody's realized, but every single month in the year we have rain as if it is the hurricane season, and we saw that again last weekend. And so the progress we've made has been good, but again, because of the rain, we have you know different times uh, where we not being very productive, but the contractor is working every day. Again, an opportunity for young men and women in the constituency of Grosley with skills to get some level of employment, and that has been working very well so far. So we should be having the opening ceremony for that uh, park, the Grosley Recreational Area, um, Towards the middle of the year, I'm hoping, weather permitting, if everything is in Russia now, you have to say weather permitting. And so before the end of the year, we should be having a, a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Grosley Recreational Park. Congratulations, Julian Alfred, continue to make us proud. And we're hoping for big things this year. Keep following. Thank you. Yes, good day. And um, I have not spoken to the St. Lucian public through you for 2024. And I'm very confident that 2024 is bringing out some very good news for the public service. Um, right now, we have a consultant on ground who is preparing a strategic plan for the public service, as well as an operations manual and an action plan. This um, report, when it is released in the coming months, will certainly set the path for us to really look at reforming and modernizing the, the public service. Um, as you know, the public service is a very challenging um, entity, not just the public service department, but the entire government machinery. And we have over 7,000 persons in the public service. There are over 14, about 14,000 people 
who are actually compensated by governments, coming from governments, recurrent expenditure on a monthly basis. And each ministry has to manage their human resources. And the public service, as the managing entity, it is like the clearinghouse for the human resource capacity of government machinery. It also looks at facilities management, the, all the premises that government rents and those government owns. The public service is responsible for lease agreement as well as upkeep of these um, departments. We also deal with IT, information communication technology, as well as organizational development. And this public service has a staff orders, the staff orders that has been in existence for over 40 years. And at this point, we are in the process of revising and bringing a new bill for modernizing the public service. So we have the bill ready. It is now in the public domain for discussion and feedback from the public. And we also have the regulations that will accompany the bill. And from all indication, the administration of the public service will be moving to a new location sometime, hopefully this year, where we call the Orange Grove Plaza. There are two floors that government has actually committed. We are actually ready to pay the rent, and over a period of time, it will be owned by the government. So the public service administration will be located in that place. And um, I think public officers are bracing themselves for that new, new arrangement. One, location. Two, new regulations. And three, we speak about a strategic plan that will guide the, the way forward. So they are very excited and we have to ensure that we prepare the public officers for that change. And the change will require some serious training, reorientation, so that they understand what that new creature, that new entity will be like in order for us to improve the quality of service that we give the St. Lucian public. We want it to be efficient and we want it to be effective. If who is the consultant and how much is it costing the government? Some... Um, the, the consultant is somebody who has been working in the public um, domain. He's a very experienced regional consultant because sometimes we do choose consultants that will speak to what we want to hear. So it's good to hear the views of somebody who is not um, a St. Lucian, because when we are in our own little corner, we prepare things for ourselves. So we actually got a consultant um, in the name of um, Dr. Aubrey Armstrong. He has a long history of working with public servants throughout the region. And we felt that he was the best person who would be able to do justice to what we want. Um, the, the consultancy, I don't want to disclose the cost of the consultancy um, before I prefer the prime minister to handle matters of finance. Okay, can we expect more um, from the digital Gov platform, the online platform for the public service? Can we see more um, agencies, more units having their services being available on that platform this year? Right, because we are supposed to provide 154 services and within the next few months we are putting in 16 more. So they are actually steadily improving the number of services that we are um, trying to provide to, to the government agencies. So there was a little slowdown, but now they are at full speed because that project is almost coming to an end in the next um, few months or so. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure of them, which ones now, but I was informed that there were 16 of them coming on stream. Yes, Madam Minister, on, on a different subject. You know, last year we had a big push with the Know Your Rights campaign, the gender, uh, fighting against gender violence. Moving into the new year, can you bring us up to date as to you know what has happened, what is taking place, or, you know what is, you know, for the first side for this. Right. Um, this project is going on full steam. Um, in fact, as we speak now, they have a stakeholder consultation at the Harbor Club Hotel where we are developing a gender policy for St. Lucia. 
And today we are actually expecting feedback from the stakeholders so that we can finalize the document. As you know, the Know Your Rights campaign is a project that is funded by the French government. It costs, that one I can speak to the cost, it costs about 600,000 euro. And um, they are actually doing all the billboard the campaign and sensitizing the public, as well as training. It is supposed to last for about two years before it is completed. So definitely the project is on stream and is moving at peace. We have some persons, consultants that were brought in by the French um, embassy and they are actually stationed here and working with the Department of Gender to implement the project. And what about the, the, the impact with the community? What, what about the feedback? How does it fit in with the different NGOs? And well, it, they have to do com community engagement and that's what they are doing today. Um, they are getting feedback from the NGOs and the stakeholders on the, what is happening with um, gender and gender equality. Because you see, in the absence of a clear policy, you hear a little piecemeal of different things that uh, um, different groups and different persons are doing with regards to gender and gender equality. But when we establish a policy, everybody will be clear on what direction the government is going and what are the things that we need to do to ensure that um, we achieve gender equality as we are mandated, one, by the United Nations and other agencies that are willing to support us in advancing the, the issue of equality between men and women in our society. And the domestic violence bill will play a part in this? Yes, in fact, we have quite a few projects that are going on. In fact, after we passed the domestic violence bill, we got an outpouring um, sources, a set of sources that came in to give us the, the resources, both financial and human resources, to push that agenda forward. We have done training for about 50 policemen on how to handle domestic violence issues because when people find themselves in the domestic violence cases, the police did not know how to distinguish a regular criminal activity or one that is um, a, a domestic one. So in that case, we did not have data to, to disaggregate what is domestic violence and what is not. So now the police are getting training so that they understand when somebody comes in to make a report, they can decipher whether this is a domestic violence case or this is just a straight criminal offense. Mm -hmm. Madam Minister, any updates on the passport office? Yes, the passport office, they should have moved in maybe about two weeks ago. But apparently there was some little work that went on there without the knowledge of the landlord. And that actually contaminated the air in the air conditioning unit. So they had to go back again and do a general cleaning. We have done an air quality test and everything is okay now. So they are all set. They have contracted a, a, an agency to help them in the moving. So they are ready to move all the equipment. In fact, initially they were short of furniture because it's not, when you move into a, a new home, you may not want to carry all old things you had in the previous home. So therefore they requested some new furniture. And as a result, we had to acquire these, including what they will be moving across with. So they should be ready to move now. Do we have an updated date or when they will move? Um, in fact, as far as I was told, they should be moving around now. They have already packed up all the things. So the agent supposed to start because they were just waiting for the all clay for them to move into the room. Does that mean the passport is closed? Then? Um, what since they had packed up things to move, they had decided that they were going to deal with only emergency passports because remember things are not settled. In fact, we have the Canadian banknote that are supposed to be here on island to help them set up all the electronic and the technology part they have to come in to assist to do that. We have GITS that is also assisting. So everything is in place, all the wires and everything is already in place for them to, to start working there. So we just have to give them a little breathing space in terms of a week or two for things to be settled. And I, the media will be informed when everything is ready so we can do a little media launch of the, the, the new space. So you'll get a chance to visit the space to see what it is like. I have a question about AI. Um, as minister who is responsible for digitalization of 
well, the government, I guess, the public service. Um, many individuals are questioning whether the implementation of AI will cause them to lose their job or lose income opportunities. Um, what is your thoughts on that? Uh, how can it help or what are some of the things that we must pay attention to? Well, um, information technology is not a matter of reducing the workforce. It's a matter of creating new skills and new avenues for people to work. So you will find the same things that you used to do manually, now you are going to do it electronically. So now you are moving into a new stream of work, and therefore that will require quite a bit of training so that people can adjust from moving from the, the manual work into the technological um, world. So we are not looking at reducing the, 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 the workforce, but we are repurposing what they are doing and giving them new skills to, to do the things that we want to do at a more expeditious um, rate. Madam Minister, within this year, we have just beaten a high resolution has now recorded for this, for the last two months of um, highest homicides and murders. Concerns that people have been very violent. What can the government do? What can we do in terms to, to, to stop this kind of nature that we share on our island? Okay, I think what government has been doing and what we will continue to do is to improve the social programs in St. Lucia. And as we talk of violence, we have to find out why. Why do we have violence in the society? And you have to look at your surroundings in terms of, is it something that St. Lucia is the only country or the highest and why? And we look at what's happening in the region and for those persons who know our physical location, and there are quite a few studies going on now to find out why St. Lucia is attractive for certain persons who want to carry out certain activities. And you will know that we are bilingual, we speak Creole, and therefore we are strategically placed close to countries that are linked to the what you call the demand countries in terms of Europe. And that is one of the reasons they have given that St. Lucia is an attractive location a more attractive location than maybe St. Benson or Grenada, where Creole speaking is not one of their the languages. However, you know the strategic location of the Caribbean between South America and North America. And therefore, we are caught in the middle, not just St. Lucia, we are caught in the middle of where you have the supply of certain um, um, stocks and the demand on the other side. And as a result, we have to, the, the, the bulk of the pressure comes on us to take care of ensuring that undesirables do not enter our shores and we do not allow it to go to the other side. So whether you're dealing with drugs, whether you're dealing with guns, these are things that are in high demand right now. And therefore we have to protect our borders. And that is where we are equipping the police and the law enforcement persons and bringing the more sophisticated equipment to deal with what we call the care and hopefully that we get a cure. But in addition to that, we are also looking at the preventative mode where our young people, we have programs to involve our young people so they do not resort to criminal activities. And as you know, the prime minister has spoken about the youth economy we are looking at the semi-professional league. There are a lot of persons who just sit on the block and they can play good football. We are going to compensate them for that. We are doing skills development. We have to find a way to keep them in schools. And we do not want some of the undesirables to infiltrate the education system. So we have to ensure that we work on the preventative mode because the cure and the care is very expensive because we have to give policemen all the ammunition they need. We have to give them vehicles. We have to hire more policemen to go out there to fight crime. What we can do is to prevent our young persons from engaging in criminal activities. And that is where the social programs, the number of social programs that government is putting in place, you may not see the results right away, but now we are actually working on it so that we keep our young people. If you look at the, the statistics, it will show you that a lot of the persons who are involved in criminal activities are young persons. And we have to find out 
what would be the cause of that and what can we do? And I go on the preventative while the Prime Minister deal with the care and the cure with the police. Mm -hmm. Madam Minister, the last time you were here, you had update, uh, well, you updated us on the missing gun at Borderly. There was a report that was submitted to the public service. Um, uh, what happened after that following this? Um, the Public Service Commission, some people do not know the difference between the Public Service and the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission is a separate entity, an independent entity that operates under the Constitution. The Prime Minister cannot tell the Public Service what to do. The Public Service Department cannot tell the Public Service Commission what to do. So when there is a case like what you mentioned with regards to Borderley, the findings of the, the case is submitted to the Public Service Commission and they have to sit and call the parties. It's almost like a court case for them to hear what are the pros and cons, what are the arguments, and then they take a decision as to what the outcome. So we are, are, are actually awaiting the outcome of the, from the Public Service Commission on that matter, but it has been submitted to them. Well, we have, I, I can tell you, based on what I have heard before, there are some cases that have gone to the court and it took forever there were some that have gone to the commission that took four or five years. We cannot tell the commission, you need to call that case now and deal with it. All I can say is that we have submitted it to them and we'll await. We are hoping that they, they move quickly on the matter. What of the issues at the Labour Department, um, the meetings with the Labour Commissioner, also the representatives for the employees, what's happening right now? Okay, um, we had a meeting with all the staff. That is the only department where I have met the staff twice. Usually I meet heads of department, but in the case of the labor department, I met every single person. There are about 30 persons who are employed at the labor department. And in that discussion, we looked at a number of challenges that they have. What um, is in our favor is that we actually commission a needs assessment. We actually get somebody to do a needs assessment. We got the outcome of the needs assessment and we had a meeting with the staff to report to them what were some of the findings in the needs assessment. We addressed the issue of human resource um, capacity. There were some areas we had some vacancies. We have submitted that to the um, Public Service Commission for them to advertise the post. And we also look at the issue of training because what we have discovered is that there are many persons in the past who were sent to the Department of Labor through transfers and they may not necessarily have the skills for the job. So now we have to look at training and we also look at the refurbishment of the building so that we enhance the work environment for them to work. So these are some of the critical issues that came out of that, of that meeting we had with the staff at the Labor Department. Um, yes, we've heard a lot about the border control you know, in terms of infiltrating the, the criminal elements in the supply of guns and stuff. And even lately, Jamaica, one of the bigger countries, say that they cannot do it alone. You know, they need cooperation. What, what is St. Lucia's case in that situation? Are, are we getting outside the help? Are we getting, you know, is there, is there dialogue to help? Yes, but as I, as, as I want to stress quickly is that when we deal with um, um, law enforcement, we deal with the issue of crime. The same way the criminals have a network of operating, governments too have a network of operating in terms of combating it. So you will not find Jamaica, Trinidad, St. Lucia, Grenada working in isolation. They actually work together so that we use intelligence to know what is happening in one country and how we can protect our borders. So that I know is in place. And the Prime Minister, as Minister with Responsibility for National Security, last year he was heading COSOD security in CARICOM. And that is all the countries in CARICOM dealing with national security within the respective countries. He was actually chairing that committee for a whole year. And in this um, late last year, he handed over um, that, that chairmanship. But during his tenure as chairman for COSOD Security in CARICOM, we managed to get a number of things in place. And we also got a number of agencies that came in to assist St. Lucia. And you have the British, the Canadians, the European Union, the French, and a number of other outside agencies have, in fact, um, OAS, all of them. And we have a small committee 
that are working with us to look at all our needs. They have asked the police to submit the, the list of needs and how they can assist. So from our end, we are doing our part in St. Lucia, but we also network with the other countries to get some best practices from them. What is it they are trying, what is working, and then we cannot put it in the public domain exactly what we are doing, but there are quite a bit of work done on the ground to deal with border control and national security under the prime minister. And with, with my portfolio as home affairs, which is the other part where we deal with bodily fire, um, the marine unit, probation and parole. Mm -hmm. um, the Prime Minister, we have a, a report that was presented and the Prime Minister will be inviting the persons who were involved in designing that plan to come forward to make a presentation to cabinet on that. That's where we are with it. Okay, morning again, everybody. Richard Frederick, Minister of Housing and Local Government. I am just pleased to announce that um, the battle relay is going pretty, pretty well. Um, as you all know, we started off last week, Sunday, in Castries Southeast. Um, yesterday, we were in Castries South. It culminated there for the day. It was handed over to the Prime Minister in his constituency of Castries East. As we speak now, the battle is currently in Taiwan. And St. Lucians are participating today in the diaspora over in Taiwan. And my instructions are they are enjoying it to the max. They are given coverage, which will be aired subsequently. But I have had the opportunity of viewing a live piece, and I can tell you, St. Lucians are indeed elated to participate in that leg of it. Um, we are not sure, but arrangements have been made. Arrangements have been made for um, the battle to continue in Morocco tomorrow. There may just be some difficulty that may not uh, cause the event to unfold the way we wanted to. Um, but as we speak now, uh, those difficulties are being worked on and hopefully uh, the Moroccan leg of our St. Lucian contingent will have a feel of the battle tomorrow. And on Wednesday, we we'll resume with the Honorable Prime Minister in Philip Joseph Pierre, who will uh, tour the entirety of the Castries East constituency, where we expect to have a blast. So far, I can say, tell you without any fear of contradiction, and it is beyond an iota of doubt that the battle really has had the footprint of a program that unites us, that transcends the political divide, and bring out the best in our people. There are loads of people in the various constituencies who have made contributions throughout the length and breadth of St. Lucia, and those people remain relatively unknown. The battle relay is one exercise that brings the efforts of those people to national acclaim. So I am indeed pleased that it's going on very, very well, and things are happening in a manner that we expected. It is just that it's getting bigger and better. I am sure you all realize that loads of corporate citizens now come on board, and if it were an exercise they believe that was not worthy of being associated with, they would never volunteer to come on board. And I speak of St. Lucia helicopters. I want to express my gratitude to them. They came on board, and in Sufre, Auntie Emma had land, sea, and air. She had the boats, she had the helicopter, and of course, she had land. So it is something that I don't know what next we are going to do. I, I rather suspect in the not too distant future, one of the constituencies might dig a tunnel somewhere and they'll have the battle to pass under the tunnel. But this is just <laughs> wishful thinking because the battle really has brought out a lot of creativity in our people. Um, it has brought out a lot of, if you want to call it friendly banter, it has brought out a lot of um, friendly competition, so to speak. 
And you know, everybody wants to get involved. I want to see hats off to the guys in Viewfort, the guys of Shantytown in Viewfort. When we all thought that, you know, the guys would not get involved in an activity like that, I was indeed elated. I was, I was pleasantly surprised to have seen participation to its fullest extent by the guys in Shantytown. I want to say hats off to them. I want to let them know that, uh, you know, we can just pretend there is a battle really every day and uh, let us live in peace and unity. And they went about singing Nouvelle uh, Batonu, Banu Batonu. It was a really, really good display. And once again, let me compliment the Viewfort South Constituency Council and all those guys from Shantytown and across the constituencies that saw it necessary to get themselves involved in this exercise that no doubtedly unites us across the length and breadth of this country. Yes. I want to hold on, Jerry. <laughs> okay, yesterday, uh, I have some good news as well. I taught the constituency with my Honorable Prime Minister. Um, and it's one thing with Philip Joseph Pierre. When you believe you're tired as a minister, like the Energizer Bunny, he keeps going and going and going. And I have an amazing uh, Prime Minister in Philip Joseph Pierre. He called me yesterday and he said to me, Mr. Minister, let's meet in Castries Central. And so we traversed the city. We walked actually through the city and certain suggestions were made. And I can tell you, those suggestions that were made yesterday are already being worked on. Um, the parking lot next to the printry. For those of you who don't know, the printry is earmarked for demolition. Given its physical condition, it is um, challenging engineer from an engineering standpoint um, to keep this property there. It's like one of the old CDCs, if not even older. Anyhow, um, it is earmarked for demolition. And so the printry, is almost in a vacant state. It's a structure that is almost unoccupied. And what we did was we had parking lots next to that place that were earmarked for persons, government workers who worked at the printry. And only yesterday, the prime minister said, Mr. Minister, why don't we build a nice arcade-like, beautiful colors, painted properly, newly built, uh, for the vendors who sell in that general area, the, the vendors who unfortunately uh, make an ISO of the city, I don't think it's the intention, but invariably that is what happens um, uh, on a Sunday when you walk the city and you realize that they leave their tools of trade hanging about, you, you come to the realization that, look, we can do better as a people. So in compromise, he has asked me, to almost immediately start construction of some vending booths in that parking lot. And I could tell you they started. He has also asked me to rejuvenate or rehabilitate Bidu Park. And that already is being worked on as well. So we shall be building some vending booths there to ensure that that person, there is somebody who sells right at the junction there by the print tree under the almond tree. It's an ISO. It is. And I've always said that this government is not against anybody making an honest dollar. If somebody would have been against some, uh, 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 any Malawi, so to speak, making an honest dollar, it would not be me. And that is why when I said nobody would touch my vendors, I remember it brought to mind um, what the last administration had done to the vendors on two consecutive Mother's Day. To, took all this stuff and went and dumped it at Masha. I don't know if some of you remember that. They used to, if guys were vending in carts, they would take the cart or take the trolley, just take everything, confiscate everything. I don't think this is right. I believe we can arrive at a compromise. There are competing interests invariably. You have the interest of the vendors. They have a right to survive. You have the interest of business owners who have a right to um, you know, use their property unimpeded. And of course, the pedestrians have a right to use the sidewalk without any kind of impediment placed on that sidewalk. So those are balancing interests that, that we need to take a middle ground in. As I said earlier, no one should go far left or far right. 
it is something that we have to reason out and to do what's best in the interest of compromising the situation. So it is in that regard, the prime minister has asked me, the mayor was with me, and I can tell you, we have already allocated other parking spaces for those persons who still use that parking lot, and we shall be proceeding with due alacrity on the construction of those new vending booths with a view of removing those persons there once and for all. After this is done, I have to send a warning to persons who, in a haphazard way, just start the construction of all those little, you know, booths all over the place. That cannot be tolerated. It is not aesthetically pleasing. It is not something that you want your visitors to see. Yes, we have a right to survive, but we need to do it in a manner that lends a cord to, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to do it in an, in, in an unlawful way, in a sporadic way. Let's do it in a manner that lends a cord to the beautification of our city. In the interim, I know that some of the vendors who were vending there had complained that they are now displaced. In the interim, um, where can these people go to sell? Well, I'll tell you this. When I'm asked, where are you putting me? I would respond by asking, who put you there? You see, um, persons do whatever they do on their own volition, on their own accord, and accept, uh, expect it to be embraced by all and sundry. This cannot be right. And I could tell you, without mentioning names, there are a few vendors I know personally who occupy booths around the place. Okay? They are tardy on their payments. They owe city council a lot of money. They leave the booths with their children, and then they take trees and go elsewhere. This cannot be right. It cannot be right. And, and so, like I said, it's a matter of striking a balance. Um, I do believe that construction will not take very long. Uh, we are proceeding with due haste. So I do believe in the not too distant future, the situation will at least be partially resolved. And this is the way we want to proceed. We cannot do everything at once, but we want to proceed in, in a manner to ensure that those interests are taken care of whilst we try and beautify the city. But I want to tell vendors again to please discontinue the practice of putting up things all over the place. The reason I started the vending booths, I could never forget. In 2007, I was the Minister of Physical Development and the District Rep for Castry Central. And I almost cut my face whilst walking by the Ave Maria School with a piece of steel that was protruding, a vent, which a vendor had left there. I started building the vending booths because I realized I could not send them on the streets. I demitted office in 2011. And between 2011 and 2021, not one single booth was built. So you have a situation where the number of booths available are stagnant, but the interest of persons who want to vend keep growing. So there was no kind of congruence in terms of availability of booths to people who wanted to vend. And so we now have to confront the situation as it is. I have resumed, and I'm sure most of you know, I have built a number of booths since I came, but they are still not enough. And so we are continuing on the trend until the situation should be, could be brought to one of at least or approximate normalcy whilst balancing the interests of beautification and the interests of vendors. Uh, we balance that and we find middle ground to ensure that Castries looks appealing and aesthetically pleasing. As, as, um, in the interest of um, law and order in the city, we heard that there be a review of the city police to complement the Royal Central Police Force. What, what is the status of this development? You see, the sad reality is some journalists, I, I won't say all that, eh? they, they would just take what they hear and put it in the news. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I'm in charge of the city police and I have no knowledge of the city police complimenting. It is not something that's far-fetched. 
But I don't think that as we speak, this is something that's been worked on. I am unsure about that. And I believe I would have been in the know. So do you, do you say that the city police are working effectively enough to help? Oh, now you're asking me a different question. Okay, let me just see. Um, the city police, in my view, have been doing a phenomenal job. Um, where there is a void, where there is a lacuna in terms of uh, law enforcement presence, um, the city police would step in. Only last night, city police were able to arrest a perpetrator who was equipped with a, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, he had some kind of instrument to break into one of the huts by the customs department. And the city police were informed and they ended up there with haste and the person is currently in custody. I am sure you realize when we have the visitors around town, you see a heavy, heavy presence of the city police. If they can complement or if they can work together, or if they can form part of the police force, I have absolutely no qualms with that. Um, all the better, this government is working to one objective, I creating a safer space for the St. Lucian citizens. And no matter what kind of uh, device that is used, no matter what kind of strategy that is used to reach in that objective, once that is the objective of the exercise, then invariably we will be on the same page. I know they complement them very well. They work together um, as to whether they can be part or not part of the police force. That invariably would be a policy decision that cabinet would have to deliberate on. And that is why I'm saying uh, probably I don't think this is something that's been worked on now. I'm not sure, but as and when we, we get to that bridge, most definitely we will cross it with letting you, uh, the journalists of this country, know exactly what is happening. So there's no um, review of the city police. The Prime Minister, I think, um, earlier the last month, he, he did indicate that he um, a review, not, I don't know if it's to join the police. Ah, well, that was, <laughs> now that's a totally different question. <laughs> There's a question was asked. No he said they, they uh, he spoke with you he yes. to undergo a review of the operation. Yes, now that's totally different with a view of joining or working alongside the police. Yes, invariably we aim for excellence. We aim for excellence and uh, in all departments, whether government or otherwise, you would find that there are areas. Um, once you institutionalize something that had not been there before, you would have teething problems. As you recognize and realize what the teething problems are, you figure, well, look, we have to do this to curb it. We have to do that to curb it. And yes, indeed, we are looking at the operations. For example, right now, um, we, we, we are deliberating over whether, you know, we use the manpower within to promote and create a hierarchical structure that uh, basically simulates what happens in the police force, whether, you know, so there are a lot of little operational things that are being done now, and the prime minister was correct, but I'm not sure the objective of the exercise, as you asked me, was to work or to join the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. So the compliment, but one of the complaints has been that Past five or six o'clock, you don't see the present. But you said last night they were able to. Yes, yes. The so that, that is part of the strategy. Yes, so yes. Exactly. The operational thing is whether they work longer hours, whether they, you increase the amounts, whether they can work uh, in plain clothes, all of those things are being looked at because obviously you want a situation where police presence is necessary in uniform to serve as a deterrent. Otherwise, you want the police presence to be one where you apprehend offenders um, with a minimal uh, uh, suspicion kind of thing. So all of those things are being looked at. And at the end of the day, when the recommendations are made with respect to the operations, we invariably will look at it and decide whether it is worthy of implementation or part thereof is.